Hello and welcome and thank you so much for joining us live this morning. We have almost 700 teachers registered for this webinar, but so many people are busy, busy, busy this morning on the very last day of the New South Wales school term. Uh, and, um, and, and there's lots of people asleep in the UK and there's lots of people having dinner in the US uh, or still teaching. So they'll be uh, so welcome to you if you're watching this on the replay. Um, I'd like to first of all call out my fa fabulous co-host extraordinaire Beth who's going to be helping us this morning with um, the interviews, the pre-recorded interviews that we are going to be showing. And uh, it's, it's just going to be all together incredibly fun. So, um, all right, I would like to um, tell you about how today is going to run. It's going to be structured around our four pre-recorded interviews with four people whom I'm so delighted to be able to call my frolegs. That is friends plus colleagues, frolegs. So we have Abe Citronovsky, uh, Michelle Matter, Leela Viss and Anthony Vandenbroek. And you're going to hear about how to prepare for every aspect of performing, which is so much more than just learning to play the notes. Um, it's, you're going to hear about what judges and examiners look for, about how to bow, how to really get um, rid of some of the stress leading up to a performance, how to warm up on a foreign piano, and how to get that X factor into a performance, plus much more. And I'm just so excited to be able to present these four interviews for you because they're incredibly informative. They're going to be wonderful for your students as well. And each person, each different expert brings a fresh perspective to what it means to prepare your very best performance. So um, Beth and I have edited these interviews down to about 10 to 15 minutes each. And um, the full length interviews are available on YouTube for you to view. And we're gonna send you links to those full length interviews when we send you the link to the replay. Um, and that way you can just watch them and soak up every word of what these wonderful experts had to say. I'm also going to talk about my own experiences as a student and as an adult and as a teacher performing. And I encourage you to make use of our chat, our webinar chat, so that you can tell us of your experiences as well, because that's what makes attending live so much fun the chat. I think it's really, really important that we can all see what each other has to say. Now, um, and that makes it fun. All right, so we are going to start off with a poll. I am very fond of polls. That's how I like to, I like to do this in all my webinars. And this poll is all about what sort of performer are you? And there are two questions in the poll. So Beth is going to launch this poll. The first question is, are you a confident performer? So there's, yes, I love the stage. Yes, sort of, not really, and no, I'm terrified. For your confidence level, how comfortable are you on the stage? And then the second question is, are you a reliable performer? So I mean, in terms of accuracy and memory. Um, yes, absolutely, I can always hold it together. Yes, sort of, not really, or no, it's usually disastrous. So while you make up your mind as to your answers to each of those questions, I'm going to tell you about me. Now, as a young student, I was an extremely confident performer. I had no problem. In fact, still, I have no problem getting up on the stage. My confidence level was fine. I never really suffered from nerves. But boy, oh boy, I was unreliable. Something always went wrong. Always. Um, and I just, I just wasn't practicing the right way. I don't think my teacher really prepared me for the, the real ins and outs of how to get a reliable performance. I had a fantastic mentor in high school, a teacher who said, if you want to give a fantastic performance, you must practice giving a fantastic performance. That was her mantra. But somehow, I, like I knew this, but I didn't properly adapt it in my practice. And as a result, I was plagued with memory lapses and things that just always went wrong. And it, I remember it dearly cost me in many an exam or a Stedford. So, um, so Beth, can you please talk about the results of our poll? I sure can. I just hit end poll, but I wanted to share the results. So let me open that up. Where did it go? 
Oh, there it went. It opened on my second screen. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, so our results show that most people are, yes, sort of confidence performers uh, at 49%. Uh, only 9% are terrified. And I hope you get a grilled cheese and a glass of wine soon. And then uh, are you a reliable performer? 70% uh, answered yes, sort of. 16% are absolute rock stars and can absolutely hold it together. 2% are disaster and 12% not really. So those are the results of our poll. Okay. So all over the place. Well, except that most people are saying yes, sort of, for confidence and yes, sort of, for reliability. So that's that's kind of probably what we expect. And I think if we add in a little modesty, uh, the, the, the humility of the group and the modesty of the group, I'd probably pitch that a little higher. You're probably all better than, than what you just said. Um, for myself, I would have ticked yes, I love the stage, but I would have ticked no, not really for a reliable performer um, when I was younger. Now I am definitely, I'm definitely more reliable now, but, um, and, and that's good because I actually give professional development sessions on this stuff. Um, so um, one of my, um, but if I had heard any of these four interviews that you're going to hear today, if I'd heard even one of them as a student, or if my teacher had talked about half the things that you're gonna to hear today, oh my gosh, my performing would have been just so much better as a student. Um, so, um, so these days, as I said, I definitely do professional development on performing and performance anxiety. And one of my favorite sessions is called The Seven Deadly Performance Sins. Uh, and I usually start off this session by doing a live performance and purposely giving the worst performance that I can possibly give. So I thought I would actually just show you a video that um, one of my audience members filmed this one time when I did this session. And I'm gonna show it to you now. And what I would invite you to do is for you to post in the chat all the things that you can see that I'm doing wrong in this performance. So here we go.
Okay, right. So I can see that you, uh, a few people have put some things in, in the chat. Um, so uh, did you, I hope you noticed all the things that uh, I was doing wrong. And um, uh, I, it's, it seems funny, you know, when you watch a professional doing that, but don't we all have students who do these things? Okay, so um, I think you, you guys have got it all. Um, I did not bow or smile at the beginning or the end. Uh, I changed my mind about using the music. I started too fast and then I had to slow down. I got distracted by the excellent coughing fit, which I set up, by the way, in the audience. Um, and I was apologizing out loud. Um, I was tutting, I was slumping. I flicked my hair. Um, I corrected my mistakes. I stomped off stage and that was uh, really very rude of me, very rude. Now all of those things that I did wrong fit very nicely into seven categories, the seven deadly performance sins, which I'm gonna come back to later on. Um, but now that we've seen what not to do, let's talk about what we should do. And we're gonna start off with our first interview with, of what we should do to get a really fantastic performance. And that first interview is with Abe Citronovsky, who's who I'm going to call Avi, because that's what, that's what I call him. Now, um, Avi has spent his entire life in his entire adult life in music education, from teaching in secondary schools to private music education, to creating teaching aids, to cre to examining um, to examining with uh, for Ansca and adjudicating many many Estedfords. Um, and although he's now formally retired, he is still teaching and examining a little and performs regularly. So um, now uh, Avi and I met because he started his scale cards business almost the same time that I started my Blitz Books business, which was now 21 years ago. And uh, we met because um, I happened to notice there was a typo on one of his flyers and I rang him up and talked to him and, and told him about it, which he already knew. And then we had something in common because it's so frustrating when there's a typo on a flyer and you've just printed 10,000 of them. So, um, okay, now this video is slightly longer than the others. It goes for about 15 minutes, but the full version goes for 35 minutes and it's full of so many pearls of wisdom. Uh, so uh, we'll send you that link, but in the meantime, in the meantime here is Avi. Abe Sijanovsky, welcome. Now I'm going to call you Avi because that's what I call you because you're my friend. You're more uh, than welcome. So thank you. Now uh, you are such an experienced examiner and adjudicator. So what I want to ask first is what are your best tips for helping students prepare for exams and a Stedfords? Well, good question there, because you would think that would be one and the same thing, exams and Stedfords, but they are different in that I actually think that Stedfords are a little more challenging than exams, personally. So I think if I cover the work for Stedfords that needs, needs to be done, I think that will overlap and cover all the work that a student needs to do for exams, plus more, you know, I think that that would be more than enough because I do think it's more threatening to do an aesthetic, mainly because an examiner might hear during the day a whole range of students, whereas in an aesthetic, more often than not, you've got la creme de la creme, you've got gladiators dueling with each other and you're sitting in the audience for an hour or half an hour listening to top students often playing brilliantly and that can be nerve wracking. And the adjudicator also is listening to top work and comparing your work to top work with, and that, that's a different, that's a different show, you know, completely. And it's, I think it's more challenging, more demanding. So you would say that the Steadfords are a more threatening event to prepare for. So let's concentrate on that. And you've adjudicated quite a few live Steadfords. So we want to ask you directly, if you were going to give advice to teachers on how they should help their students prepare for an Estedford. What would be your best tip? Look, I think there were look there are three there are three main areas of concern for an adjudicator and therefore they should be for a student too. One is fluency and continuity, just mastery, authoritative playing, full stop. I guess the next thing, and I, I think it's in this order actually, believe it or not, is expressiveness and emotional content. And the third, which is 
really the icing on the cake is that special special unique added thing that makes that student play that Beethoven sonata in their particular way that makes the adjudicator think gee that was interesting I could hear little Sharon in there as well as Beethoven now that's a really difficult one but I think all teachers would know what I'm talking about I think fluency is the big one that more than anything else um, needs work the continuity and not not falling off the horse and not being able to get back on again. So I've got eight clues about how to get through that. And even if that's all we spoke about, I think they would be worth hearing if I may be so bold as to suggest that. You're going to tell us now eight clues for making sure that the fluency is not interrupted. Yes, for a small, f no, <laughs> I will do that. Please Sorry. go ahead. Look, um, above all, I think, students have to subject themselves to mini performances. We have to have mini recitals before the big one, before, whether it's an exam or an assessment, because what actually happens is that there's a different type of thinking that occurs during the performance. Um, and I'm not saying it's necessarily nervous, ang anxious thinking. It's not as though you have sweaty palms and the foot's trembling and you can't swallow, but the thinking in ironically, you're more alert than ever. You're thinking backwards. Did I just play an A flat? Oh my God, there's a tricky bit. Your thinking is on steroids and it's not the sort of thinking that happens at home. When you, and the moment you're thinking differently, you're in, you're in danger land. And so you need to experience how you react during mini performances to know that, that to even register the fact that your thinking is changing during a performance. Look, number two, and I've changed my tune here dramatically from when we used to do workshops together, where I used to say automatic pilot is the enemy of mankind. Automatic pilot, where the finger, fingers play from memory, can actually save your bacon completely, but you can't rely on it. So yes, it has to be in the fingers. I, I, I realise that now that I'm performing more, but you also have to be conscious of what you're doing in a performance and that consciousness has to be there during practice so you don't suddenly decide in a performance oh i've got to remember that we both go hands go up to a flat if you're not thinking that during practice if those prompts aren't there they're not going to be there in a performance the i could go through the other ones very quickly actually because they're much more perfunctory and they're just clues that this is what i do all the time when i prepare for a recital pick up points the most important psychological prop you can possibly have if you know that line one on page two is a dicey area and you're thinking oh my god if that goes everything goes then you have to have a yellow sticker or green <laughs> whatever at the next bit uh where you know that if a disaster occurs there you just go to that point and you have to practice those pick up points even if there are 15 in, in three pages, it doesn't matter. If you don't do that work, you'll continually be scared of those horror zones. If you know you've got pickup points, it takes away the fear. The next method in terms of fluency is I call pin the tail to the donkey. You look at your music, you just point randomly at this bar, that bar, and you start there because then you have to know what you're doing. The next one, I've been using this for the last year. I'm, I'm performing the moonlight, I sing, no, I'm not, the second movement, I sing the first phrase, da, 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 I play the phrase after, da, 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 I sing the next one, I play the phrase after, it's a killer, you really have to know what you're doing, sometimes it takes weeks to be able to do that, I play along, next method, I play with the recording, slower or faster, and that actually, you feel as though you're being chased by wild dogs, it's very hard, especially with the rubato that you're, you're tracing of the, of the recording, that's a terrific one. I start every second bar. You know, I look at the music and I adjust it. My eye skips the second bar to the fourth bar to the sixth bar. I start every third, fifth, seventh, ninth bar. And they're all ways of, you think you know what you're doing and you don't because normally it's just one set of finger movements after another. Whereas if you break the continuity like that, pinning the tail to the donkey, um, singing a phrase and then playing the next phrase, you actually have to know what you're doing. I think if you use a range of those methods, the fluency is there. And at least you can convince the adjudicator that you know what you're doing.
and the rest is a bonus but if that's not there it's a no-show and even in an exam i'll just say one more thing even in an exam you might get away with an a if there's a small break but some examiners will say as my last grade three student the examiner said beautiful plain beautifully expressive a pity about the small breaks in your list a and she got a b plus um, and that was the only comment. So even there in an exam, that break bothered that, that examiner. An adjudicator, it would bother an adjudicator even more if the standard is sky high, which it often is. <sighs> <laughs> so the, the, um, the strategy that you're suggesting is, is getting a range of skills together because it's all very well to be able to play on automatic pilot. That can be useful. I but if that be. breaks down and you haven't rehearsed which is it's much harder just starting from random spots if you can't do that if you're only ever relying on That's this right. bar triggering this bar triggering this bar triggering this bar beautifully yeah. said Be that, i loved what you said then about triggering because that's what happens in automatic pilot this set of movements trigger trigger a sort of a neural response but when you're thinking differently and spooking yourself as anna goldsworthy used to do to herself for years um the trigger mechanism just goes and not always it can't i've been saved by automatic pilot that's why i've changed my tune about that but i wouldn't rely on it okay so we covered we've covered off fluency can we move on to expressive text oh all right i'm glad we can do this because i i think that's super important but still not as important in my opinion as showing an authoritative mastery over the over the technique um I think the expressiveness has to be there, not from day one in practice, but as soon as there's fluency, I think the students have to, and there are ways of doing that, have an expressiveness in their playing that is absolutely transmissible and, and pick upable by the listener. And often that is imagery or a story, uh, whether, I mean, I use stories all the time, more often than not, so for me, a story works. Sometimes I put words to the story, you know, um, things like that often work. Um, some students can't think in pictures, so they just have to think this part's more exciting. This is whatever it is, but it has to be there during practice so that it is automatically there during a performance. But if it's not there during practice, day in, day out, it certainly won't be there during performance. Yeah. Right, so now on to the third uh, component of a very successful performance, which is what I would summarize as the X factor, which is what you're saying, okay. that's something a little extra. Look, this is how I got my students to do it. Okay, I know this, I don't know how many toes I'm gonna to be stepping on, but I used to say, okay, there's the Moonlight Sonata movement one. You know what Beethoven wants. He, he wants it to be a regular triplet movement it's calm, cool, and collected. And every now and then there's this beautiful harmonic surprise, but you know, we, you don't drop the waters. That's what he wants. We know what he wants. If there's no Beethoven and no score with the dynamic markings, what would you want to do with this? There are no adjudicators, no examiners. Be your most excessive self. Play it for me the way you want to. They do it. And then we have an eclect, we have a, a synthesis. And I say, I reckon you could get away with that. I would never do it, but you actually managed to do this. I don't know, there's something about the way you do that, that, oh my God, it worked. I would never do that on line three. That's just ridiculous. You know, that sort of rubato is unctuous, but maybe a bit more rubato at that cliffhanging, you know, so I, I allow them total free reign after they've learned the score and what they know is needed in the baroque period for example or whatever which is very very much more rigid um and then we just do a comparison of what we think is going too far but it's still their best most personal selves that, that, that they've exhibited and then we we just do a look i think the most magical thing that can ever happen in a performance and i could count on my hand how many times this has happened to me is when you've got the fluency you you're doing it in period style or whatever and you are so free and so on top of it that your heart just bursts open and you're playing it in the way you want to 
with with some sort of fencing in because of what you've talked about with your teacher but nevertheless it's you really emoting and i think an audience an examiner an adjudicator can feel that it's like it leaps out of the fingers of the performer and can demolish an examiner so i have i think these are wonderful wonderful summaries of how to address these three very important areas of fluency <laughs> and X factor. I, I'm sure that you let your students know when you're telling them these processes, teaching them these processes for getting um, prowess, prowess into their pieces. Yeah. You're telling them this is how you practice. You do this, and they know that you're not practicing for an exam. You're not practicing for an aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are just practicing as a as a performer, and yeah, that yeah. performer is not going to be judged. But this is what you do. This is yeah. how you prepare. This is yeah. how. Everyone should do it, not just people who are doing exams or a Oh, yeah. Look, what I'll do, if it's not going to be the neurotic getting it correct thing, I'll say to a student, okay, here's click over shears. It doesn't matter what it is. Play that in five different styles next week. I want it to be secretive. As so I were telling a friend, click over shears. Oh, the words. I want you to play it powerfully demonstratively so you're stamping your foot and you're angry so just to get them to realize there are no holds barred here there's no examiner you can do whatever you want in this piece it's free for all i wouldn't get them to do that apart from maybe once as an exercise if they weren't playing with any expression maybe i'd get them to do that with chopin for a minute and then i'd say well chopin says forte here so you're not going to be playing it secretively you know i mean it, i'd rein in so for me it depends on the it depends on the repertoire and the purpose, but I generally am too neurotic to play serious classical repertoire too loosely. That's just me. And that's where that's just a very personal response. I'm too scared. It's a very genuine and honest answer. It's really good. I think it's great for it's great for me to hear. I think it'd be great for a lot of people here to, to hear because you're a professional and it's good to know that you have these feelings as well. So we we are out of time thank you so much i think well, i enjoyed it too it's made me think look into my rear vision mirror and think about what i actually do do and have done so thank you very much samantha sam very much indeed okay wasn't that absolutely delightful uh, I encourage you to perhaps put one thing in the chat, your your most powerful takeaway from that interview um, with with Avi, because I mean, there were just so many, but maybe if you could just put one thing in the chat that really, really struck a chord with you. Um, just, and I encourage you to, when we send you the link to, uh, to the full interview, I encourage you to listen to it because there's an extra 20 minutes of wisdom in there. It's amazing. So thank you. And um, I know that uh, Avi's in this meeting today, so. Thank you. Um, uh, now, there's one thing that he didn't say in the interview, but he emailed it to me afterwards and said he wished he did say it. So I'm going to read it to you. Um, he said, now that I perform so regularly at aged care facilities, all this means much more to me personally than when I was teaching it or when I was examining or adjudicating. Now that I am walking the talk, I realize the work that needs to go in to achieve that perfect fluency and ability to survive and disguise mishaps. So, and that's really what performing is all about, isn't it? It's about surviving and disguising mishaps. And uh, Leela's gonna talk about that a bit a bit later on. Um, so um, now someone's asking about number seven on the, the eight things that, um, that Avi mentions are doing many performances, having a conscious way of thinking, automatic pilot versus pull, being fully aware, having pickup points, random starting points, alternating playing with singing, um, playing along with a recording was number seven. And starting on alternating bars was number eight. But all of that, as I said, is in the full interview. Okay, so we are now going to move on to our next guest, and that is Michelle Matter. Michelle is an Australian pianist and composer, and she's had many, many years' experience as a teacher and examiner and adjudicator. And last year, she launched Universal Music Exams in the hope of inspiring teachers and students with a new approach to exams and competitions, not the traditional approach to exams and competitions that we are all used to. Um, Michelle, and, and it's been met with a great deal of enthusiasm around the globe. And Michelle and I actually met at high school. 
Uh, we were both pianists at the Conservatorium High School and Music High School in Sydney. And uh, then we went on to study at separate universities, but then we came to work together for almost three decades at Australian music schools. Uh, where we taught together and Michelle is also the co-author of the Blitz sight reading books. So um, I'm just delighted to be able to present the interview with her today uh, and I, um, I, you, I'm sure you'll get so much out of it. Here's Michelle. Hello Michelle, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. So you are a very, very experienced examiner and adjudicator in both live and online scenarios. So can I throw an extremely general question at you to start? What are your best tips and tricks for preparing the best possible performance um, for students and also for teachers to tell their students? Well, thanks for having me firstly. Um, it's a great pleasure. And yes, I've done lots of examining and adjudicating over a long period of years. I think most of that has been live, um, both for a Stedfords and exams until of course the last couple of years where we all worked out how to do things in a completely new and different way. And so video performance, whether it's exam or whether it's um, a Stedfords and competitions has become a real thing. And I think um, to answer your question, tips and tricks for teachers, I think is just consistency and for their students to look organized. That's unbelievably broad. So um, I don't know if you want me to sort of talk about that a little bit more. Um, I think if in the day where we would turn up and everything was live, there was this sense of needing to have all your ducks in a row, that teachers and students both knew the checklist of sort of what had to happen for them to turn up and they would wear something nice and they would, you know, prepare their announcement and all of that sort of thing. And I think what's happened with the video world is that with video submission, it actually suits some students much, much better because they are more comfortable on their own instrument. They are more comfortable in their own home. Um, and that can be really great for some, for some students. Um, for most people, I think it works really well. But the thing is that there's that slight lack of the same sense of organisation, I find. So I think because the teacher is not sending them off to a physical place on the day, there is less connection between how they actually need to present sometimes. So um, I think just that that sense of still looking and um, appearing as organised and efficient as you would if it was a live performance. And I think something else that we appreciate from an examiner point of view is to have the recording device on a stand or on something that's going to keep it still because, you know, exams where it kind of goes like this and, and there's a bit you know, mum gets a bit shaky holding through the whole sonatina are not easy to watch. And again, it's just part of the overall presentation where we know that you've actually thought about the fact that this is a performance. Right. So are you saying that because we're lacking that sense of awe, because we're just doing it in our own homes, that sometimes there's just not quite the, the level of, the, of heightened, a heightened sense of occasion and uh, sometimes the videos might be just a little too casual or perhaps maybe you'd like to give us an example, some examples of what you've seen, um, some of the less desirable video submissions, just so that teachers watching today can get some sort of an idea of what not to do. Yes, that's a good word. Thank you for your sense of awe and occasion. That's exactly, I guess, what I'm trying to say. Uh, interestingly, what I have noticed over the last two years is that the Estedford sort of comp competition video submissions are uh, a little bit more have a sense of occasion than the exam ones. And uh, The exam ones, I, I get so many no shoes um, in their slippers or their socks, the cat crawling across the top of the piano, things that you don't really expect to see and that you wouldn't see if it was a live um, performance. So I, with my students, I'm just trying to make their recorded performance as much like the live performance as it possibly can be. So I would like them to, to, you know, face the camera and announce as if they would do that in their normal, in their live performances, um, to make sure that what they're wearing and 
the background behind them and just all those sort of physical things that are very, very easy to get right. Um, I'm surprised at how easily those things are, how easy those things are to get wrong, I guess, sometimes. Uh, and something that I think you do, we do see in either live or recorded submissions that I would like to see less of is the flipping through the book thing. Often with students, um, if they're going to be referring to the score for anything, you get this sort of, they come in with their book and they sort of say, I'm going to play Andante, and then they go flip, 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 oh no, backwards and forwards, you know, and then they put it up again. It's like, yeah, we're, you know, there's those little things called post-it notes and you could just <laughs> tab from one to the other and it would just be so much more efficient. So just that sense of being organized and yeah, a sense of occasion being, um dressing correctly having some shoes having the book organized that makes so much sense so it's all part of the overall impression that's coming across so students should be aware that that makes a difference especially when you as an examiner are watching video after video after video the ones that are going to stand out in a good way are the ones that are more organized and clearly gone to a lot of effort as if just the same as they would if, as if it was live the same effort. And I think the other thing that's worth saying is as examiners or adjudicators, we really want them to do well. Like you press start on any video. I mean, it's the same whether it's live or in person. Um, it, it's exactly the same really from an examiner's point of view, but I want them to play well. I, I want them to be relaxed. And when they walk into my room in a physical exam, I have the opportunity to smile and chat and, and try and make, you know, try the piano, you know, try and put them at ease with the video submission they have to have done that themselves and when you press play on a video and somebody looks terribly disheveled or nervous or whatever I sort of sit there going wow this is a video exam you could have done this more than once if you wanted to so just that sense of you know we want them to present at their best and we want to enjoy their performances so for them to be putting in just that little bit of effort before they actually press record can make all the difference from our perspective Yes, that, that's, that really is very, very good advice. Now, can you tell the difference between somebody who has put in a lot of organisation and effort and has clearly practised a lot, but it's going wrong due to nerves as compared to somebody who is um, disorganised and, and unprepared and then may blame a poor result on nerves? Yeah, sure. This is, I think this is a big thing. Uh, in a live setting, I think uh, you can tell straight off the bat, well, I can certainly tell straight off the bat, whether it's a nerves thing um, or whether it's an, an unpreparedness, which I suppose is what you're asking. Uh, and I think the way that that shows itself for me is that a nerves thing, they might play everything a little bit more quickly than I, you know, and you can sort of feel the these, these sense of angst, the sense of rush um or they may make mistakes and you know you can just tell that they're a little bit put off by their own errors whereas um lack of preparation often shows itself much more across the board or you will have some some elements that are really beautiful so a piece that might go really well and then the next piece they'll be glued to the music and it'll be very stop start so i think that there are some clear indicators in a live setting as to how prepared they are However, in a video exam or performance, I think the thing is that if you're having one of those days where it's just not coming together and you're not really happy with the performance, you don't send that performance. That's the whole thing with the video exam is that you're in your own space, you, you're in your own time and you, you're outside of this get one shot at it that we've always had with anything that's live so the advantage of a video uh, performance i suppose is that you can press stop that day and say this is not my day and come back and do it that afternoon or the next day or whenever and actually play until you are happy with it that's the advantage so i have a bit of a rule with my students of street three strikes and you're out so give it a go if you're happy with it send it in if there was something glaringly obvious that you can't live with do it again if you get to the third time pick the best of three and send it in because if it was live you would have to turn up and just live with how it went for you on the day on someone else's piano uh, you've got an advantage of being able to do it more than once but use that to your advantage and try not to get obsessive about it 
Well, that is marvelous advice. Now, just on that, so for UME exams, I assume, let's say if there was a, a submission date or a submission period, um, or let's say if there was a due date, um, I'm not, um, how, many how much lead time would you suggest a student give themselves? Like you mentioned, oh, if you, if you try, if you do it through one day and then you say, oh, today is not my day, try it another day, that assumes that a student has left themselves. Uh, enough lead time, whereas often they don't. It's like, oh my gosh, it's due tomorrow, and now I've got to do as many takes as I can today. So, what's your recommended lead time? Mm, yeah, well, that that's a a really interesting question, and it, it's also a tricky question because there are students who work better under pressure, and there are students who like a long period of time. That that's sort of a personality driven thing. I think the other thing is UME is a little different in that respect because. Um, the whole point of the way that the system itself, the booking system and everything is set up is that students or teachers primarily actually, but you choose your own exam date. So you actually choose your own day and time. It's not within a period. So anytime from March to December, if you are working towards an exam, you pick your date and you go, okay, I think I'm going to be ready in about five weeks and you pick your own exam date. And within a 10 day window, up until a 10 day window, you can actually change that. You can bump it up to 200 days in the future for free. Like there's sort of a lot more flexibility than I think what we may have been used to in the past in terms of the actual booking in to an exam. That is fantastic. And what a fantastic thing to have the flexibility of being able to choose your own exam date. I think there'll be a lot of teachers that yeah. hear about and that. And move your own exam date. So even in a live setting as well, if you've booked in and then you break an arm or something or other, it's literally click, move it up to 200 days in the future. So everybody's been very much appreciating that little aspect. That is absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you so much for these little pearls of wisdom. And <laughs> we'll put some more information about UME exams in the follow-up email. Terrific, thanks for the chat. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. Right, so um, that was just fantastic. How lucky am I to have these incredibly knowledgeable and articulate friends? Um, so I thought Michelle had some wonderful things to say and I noticed that Catherine made two very good points in the chat here. That first of all, doing video exams allows students to, who might be extremely anxious about the thought of doing an in-person exam, um, a vehicle for doing an exam where they may not have done one before. So that's really good. And another little tip for when you're submitting a video exam submission is to make sure that you're not recording a mirror image view. We don't want flip view. Um, just maybe do a little test video for one minute and then view it back and make sure it's not mirror, mirror image because, oh my gosh, that is incredibly distracting to watch. I'm sure you've all experienced something like that. Um, so regarding UME, Universal Music Exams, I really encourage you to check it out. It's incredible to have this flexibility afforded to teachers and students. Um, and also we'll be spending you, sending you a special discount code that, you're, um, that uh, students can use to book in for an exam. And that's going to be valid until July. Okay, so um, now we're going to move on to the next interview. And that's with the lovely Leela Viss. Now, uh, Leela is a teacher who lives in Denver, in Colorado, and uh, she is constantly creating tech-savvy instruction resources that she has in her studio and also on her website, leelavis.com, which I encourage you to check out. Uh, she's the past coordinator of the University of Denver's Piano Preparatory Program. She hosts the Key Ideas podcast, which you must, must have a listen to, and she offers composiums now where she's teaching students and teachers how to compose and nurture their creative inspiration. Um, so she's also a very experienced festival adjudicator, and that's why we are listening to what she has to say today. Now, um, I didn't meet Leela until five years ago. Now, Miss Beth, remember, I'm just going to show something on the screen here before we go to the interview. Um, so I didn't actually meet Leela until 
five years ago. I met her at the um, Music Teachers Association, National Association Conference in Baltimore in 2017. Uh, but I feel like I've known her all my life. And even though the past two years of the pandemic has meant that we haven't been able to see each other, we've kept close through long extended phone calls and we're constantly running pedagogical things by each other, just constantly. Um, now at the beginning of her interview, she mentions the five P's of performance and she says it so quickly that I thought that I would just show it to you first and we're going to be sending you a wonderful infographic. Here are the five P's that she talks about. Posture, prepare, perform, polite and pride. She's going to be breaking each one of those down but I thought I would just show that to you first to, so, that, uh, so that you don't panic and think, what did she say? What did she say? Okay. Um, so, um, and as I mentioned in your follow-up email, you will get a really great in infographic with those five P's. Okay, so now we're ready to, um, to show the interview and I hope you enjoy Leela. Hello Leela and thank you for joining me on this webinar. Well, hello Sam and thank you for asking me. This is exciting. I like this topic. Yes, it's a very, very important topic and you are an extremely experienced adjudicator or judge, I'm not sure what you call it, of the festivals. So, because we have a Stedfords here which have adjudicators, you have festivals with ha which have judges or adjudicators yeah. or what would you call? Them? We call them either, yes, they can be called either. Okay, so it's your job to judge performances and it's also your job as a teacher to be preparing these performances. So, mm -hmm. you have a lot to tell us. Uh, so I'm going to give you carte blanche and you can just, you can just start. You know, I think I have come to a list that works pretty well with my students in preparing them for any kind of festival, competition, whatever. And that came from seeing students play for me when I was adjudicating. And I noticed that they weren't it was almost like a deer in the headlights, like, okay, what am I doing here? Nobody told me about this. And like, what's this in front of me? And I, I felt bad for them because I thought, you know what, this is not fair to them. They maybe have pre prepared a piece, but they may not know what it's like to play for other people in a strange room on a very foreign piano. So I think the tips that I can offer you today would be things that I have taken from my experience and what I've seen in students when I do judge them or evaluate them and then how I help my own students prepare for that arena. <laughs> that sounds excellent. So I believe you have a list of 10. <clears throat> I do. Okay, well, I'll start with what I do when students are getting ready to play. First of all, I have a, a living room with a wonderful piano named Bella, and it's a fabulous grand piano, and I'm spoiled by it, and my students are as well. They can't wait to go upstairs and play on Bella, but they do not play on Bella until their pieces are performance ready, meaning they've got it memorized, all that kind of stuff. And then we go upstairs and we practice the five P's of performing. And so those are posture, prepare, perform, polite, and pride. So the very first thing is their posture. So I want them to take the time to adjust their bench. I think a lot of people, a lot of kids will just sit down like, okay, this is the way it is. And yes. I want them to say, this is your time. Take your time. No one is rushing you. Get that bench where it needs to be. And then the other thing is to look for the pedal how many times I haven't seen kids play and they didn't look for the pedal and they grab that middle one and then it sounds weird the rest of the time and they're shooken up by their entire performance because the pedal was not correct. They didn't have their foot on the correct pedal. So I make a big deal about looking with their eyes for the pedal, like, you know, reach around with your head and look for it. Uh, the next thing is then prepare. So put their hands in the place on the piano. That's another thing that, you know, it's a new piano. Okay, wait, I ought I always knew where my hands go and now suddenly I don't remember. And a lot of it has to do with those little letters uh, in the middle of the piano. If they're not the same as the piano that they practice on at home, it may just throw them. So I really have them practice. Get your hands up on the keys. And then once they're prepared and have their hands there, I want them to think about the sound and the tempo of their piece before they begin. So they actually hear it in their heads. So they know the tempo that they're gonna take before they begin. And then they perform. And then I, I basically say, get in the zone. 
and perform with confidence. And that zone is so hard to come by, you know, because those little demons come in and they start talking with you. So I don't say a lot about that. I don't like to use the word nervous with students because then that plants the seed. Oh, I'm supposed to be nervous about this. But I do want to give them a mindset of, okay, I'm performing. And I think one of the best ways to prepare them is to record them. You know, now we all have our smartphones, you know, that camera is the best feedback. It's, it's the closest thing that we can get to simulating an actual performance. So I do a lot of video recording so that they can practice with their game on type mindset. And then after they perform, then there's two important things that I want them to do. I want to them to acknowledge the audience's applause with a bow. So we learn how to bow. And, uh, I, I basically say cut yourself in half and then they dip down, of course, and then say hippopotamus and then they come back up. So about that long or are my shoes tied? Yes, my shoes are tied, but just it, it can't be too fast. And then you can't bow with your head up in the air because then you're gonna look like a turtle. So we do a lot of weird bowing type stuff. So we just get over, you know, what that what is that going to look like? And what is the best bow? Yeah. It Wait, can't be I, too fast. I ask yes, because yes. I have a uh -huh. burning question about that. OK, yes, all <laughs> the things, you know, bend over. I say to them, you know, oh, count your shoes. Oh, one shoe, two shoes. OK, so that's that's about enough. And I also tell them they can't do a wiggles bow. This is a this is a wiggles bow. So this is a Shakespearean bow. It's not one hand on your tongue, <laughs> one hand behind your back. They all go yeah. do that. I'm not sure why. But I would like to ask you, what do you tell them to do with their hands when they bow? Well, I say, I, I'll, I'll say cut yourself in half, you know, just to help them feel where they should bow, because some of them don't know where to bow, you know, that, that body awareness might not be there. So I'll say that or keep your hands by your side. Most of them keep their hands by their side. Some of them curtsy. I mean, I have some people that, you know, I don't know, they're gymnasts. And so they're like, ah, you know, all kind of stuff. So I'm gonna just calm them down a little bit. But yes, basically, I think the key is not to make the bow too fast. It has to be slow and then you come back up. That's right. It's got to be gracious. It's a way of it, exactly. Thinking. Yes. Um, gracious. Okay. Yes. So is it hands? Do they just dangle in the air forwards when they're bowing forwards or do they their hands slide down their legs? Or uh, I would say they usually slide down their legs. I mean, you've seen both. You see people do both. Uh, they, they do all kinds of things like some of the girls like to curtsy. I don't I haven't run into that lately. But there's there's going to be a variety of but I think the most important thing is to not make it too fast. The other thing is if they're playing with a duet partner, I make a big deal about okay, so who's ever on the end, you stand aside, make a hallway for the other person, and then you bow together. And I make a big deal about that. And a lot of times in recitals that won't happen. So then I'll I'll describe like, okay, now we're gonna do it again and then we'll bow correctly. So I don't think there's anything wrong with just practicing that etiquette. Cause that's the other thing. The last P is pride. And I want them to show their pride by smiling, which is not an easy thing to do because they may not be happy with their performance or they may be just scared and they're fearful and like you gotta smile. You gotta you gotta acknowledge that yes, I did this and be proud of it. That is absolutely 100% true. And, and that's one, of, I think it, one of my seven deadly performance sins is that you, you have to have a poker face. You have to smile, even if you thought it was the worst performance of your life, but you have to be very gracious because um, the audience will be clapping for you and you have to be gracious after the performance as well. So if an audience member comes up to you and says, oh, wow, that was so great. Thank you. You must just say, Oh, thank you. Even if you weren't happy, you yeah. have to smile and accept their compliment and not say, oh, no, it's the most awful playing, because that is like slapping it back in their face. You, you, you have to have pride, no matter what, how you played, being Correct. the key. That's, that's really tricky. Well, I love all those P words. Yeah, I, I think I, those came to me, I don't know, kind of really quickly, but I've used these now for years and years and years. And that really does equip students. And I'll use these in group lessons where, you know, they're just playing for each other, but then I'll say, okay, what does that person have to do now? Oh, check their posture, you know? And so just have fun with it so that they remember it. It just becomes a habit. Okay. So Lily, you also have 10 top tips of performing for us. Uh, which people can listen to in the full length video of this interview on uh, YouTube. But for now, I just have one final question for you. When Can you tell the difference between a performer who 
is just is very well prepared but is being slightly debilitated by nerves on the day um and uh, um, and do you give do you give credit for that do you do you sort of um assign value to the fact that you you can really see that it's nerves that are getting them as opposed to unpreparedness I definitely can. And I just feel for them. I, you know, that's just not how you want to show up. And especially if you've prepared for a piece. So yes, I have extended grace before. To, I'll say, would you like to start over? I think starting over though, it was not always the best thing because they're going to get caught in that sand trap again. I like to call it that, but you know, can they move on? And, you know, if they can move forward and start in a new place and regroup, recover, and and then I'm all, I'm all for them. I think that is the key. If they cannot recover, then they, they really were not prepared. And that's why they're nervous. You know, maybe there's, there's different reasons for people to be nervous. One of them could be that they were, were not prepared. And so, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Some may be fully prepared, but the nerves just kick in and they can't control it. I think there is a difference. And, um, you know, I, I would hope that they could pre that they could move on and finish. Um, but usually the people that can't finish were not prepared and were nervous about it. Yes, I would definitely agree with that. And I use your quote all the time hmm. for my students, which is that Performing is not about perfection. It is about recovering from mm -hmm. imperfection. And mm -hmm. it's so comforting to hear that you as a judge, as an adjudicator, will really give a lot of grace for that. If, you, if, they, if they can come back, it doesn't matter how bad the fall was. If they can come back, then that's worth a lot. It, it's, it's very valuable. It's, and it's a life lesson. You know, we are all going to fail. Uh, at some point, you know, the hurdler is going to knock down a hurdle and, you know, it, things happen and uh, getting back up, dusting yourself and getting back up. It was interesting. I had a student who uh, didn't, he was very prepared and I think maybe overprepared, but he was prepared and it didn't go the way he wanted to. And he, he was upset about it. He was and so I finally said, you know what, I think what you need to do is be able to forgive yourself because self-compassion goes a long way. And um, I know I have to do that myself, but then I talked to him today at his lesson and said, well, how are you feeling? He said, well, I felt a lot better because we went and had a donut. So yeah. <laughs> if all else fails, just grab a donut. <laughs> oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. Beautiful. So Leila, do you have any final pearls of wisdom for us? Well, I came up with one last week and that one is perfection is a worthy goal but imperfection is reality. And then a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a blog and I titled it Genuine Over Perfect. And that's been my mantra. And that's helped me get through a few rough times, that's for sure. That is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So imperfection is reality and genuine over perfect. There you go. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thanks, mm -hmm. Leela. Thank you, Sam. Right. So yet another session full of incredible pearls of wisdom. I hope you enjoyed that. You probably noticed that I asked Leela the a, a same question that I asked Michelle, and that is, can you tell the difference between somebody who is where the performance is going wrong due to nerves when they have prepared or when the performance is going wrong just because they haven't prepared? And she just answered in a in a, a different way um, because she was we were talking about not not can you tell the difference but do you give credit for it um, so and I think I actually tried to ask the same question in all four interviews so uh, there's something um, worth comparing because it really is an issue I think especially when some students blame nerves when actually they weren't uh, prepared or as Leela says the reason they were so nervous is because they weren't prepared um, Catherine has brought up yet another good point that at school sometimes they get taught weird vows. So I think it is very important for us to figure out what, where they, what sort of vowing they have been taught and where, and um, and then we can really go through with them which vows look the best because it's all about what looks the best to the audience. And even if they feel self-conscious doing the vow, it's a really really important teaching point. So don't forget, you can watch the full interview on YouTube and um, that's where Leela lists the 10 top tips of performance. So um, all fabulous there.
Okay, we're on to our final guest, and that is uh, Anthony Vanderbrook, who is a pianist, a teacher, and AMEB examiner. He's the deputy chair of the Australian Music Examinations Board, AMEB, in New South Wales, and he's a director of the Music Teachers Association in New South Wales. He's very passionate about teaching. He lectures in Baroque and classical performances, performance practices, and he mentors uh, piano teachers and uh, in, and teaches the pedagogy of the Taubman approach. Now that's how I first met Anthony back in 2016 when I started exploring the Taubman method to help me get over my own uh, in, my own tendonitis, my own injuries, and to help me improve my posture and improve my playing. And Anthony has actually been my Taubman teacher since then. So I have piano lessons with him as regularly as I can. Uh, in this interview, Anthony gives incredible insights to, into his experiences as an AMEB examiner and his observations, especially during the pandemic. So um, please remember to use the chat and here is Anthony. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar and giving us all your insights. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It is such a pleasure. Okay, so I was wondering, maybe maybe you could just talk us through your observations of how well students prepare for exams and whether you've noticed a difference in preparation in this new era of online exams. Right, well, um, I've definitely noticed some very big differences actually. And um, the most exciting, and I might talk about this a bit later, but the most exciting is that I've never been able to give out so many A's and A pluses as I have over the last two years, which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, exciting for me, um, exciting for my colleagues, exciting for music education in Australia, I think, because um, positive results and high caliber results mean a great future for um, music education. So. Um, as to why that might, may have happened, this is, I think there's probably a few reasons. Maybe we practiced a bit more during lockdown. Um, maybe our teachers got very um, inventive and very innovative um, through the lockdown and through the um, distance education. And our students probably practiced a bit more during, during the lockdowns and um, didn't have to travel as much. So something definitely changed. Um, and I guess the, the uh, recording um, gives an opportunity, some teachers might like to do, um, like just pretend it's a normal exam, so the kids all line up and they come in and one take and that's it. Um, and other teachers might be thinking, hey, well, this is an opportunity to really shape and really to develop the students' um, uh, abilities. So we can take, do multiple recordings, which has some positives and negatives. Um, but one of the real big positives that multiple recordings would have is that it, our students, maybe for the first time, are really listening to themselves playing. That is so interesting. And one, it's a concept I hadn't really thought of yet. And that is that, yes, what the online era has done is forced students to self-assess because they don't want to send in a video they're not happy with. Whereas mm -hmm. they never had that opportunity before. Um, if you go in and do a live exam, you know, there are no retakes and perhaps even in leading up to preparation for a live exam, maybe, maybe they did do a couple of concerts in preparation, but they probably didn't, they didn't get an opportunity to listen back to themselves. So you're saying that they're listening and they're learning and they're self-assessing and therefore the overall standard has gone up over the last two years? I think so. I mean, I, I think that um, with the opportunity to to decide, is this, you know, what, which is my best recording? What's my best take? That is different to a live performance. But um, anyone who's tried to record themselves and make a perfect recording, well, no, it's really hard to do it for one piece, let alone for five pieces. So it's not as if it's easy to do a perfect take, an A plus or, or better. Um, version of all your pieces, even if you are recording, but I think it does help to lift the standard and, um, and, and to actually just to sit objectively and listen in a way that you can't really objectively listen always when you've got so many other things to, to consider in the moment of playing. That, that's so true. Um, in previous conversations, you've, you've um, mentioned that when examiners are listening, 
that they have to listen objectively as well um, and that you um, you uh, like the AMEB recommends that adjudicators uh, sorry that examiners judge according to syllabus objectives so do you in your opinion is uh, a teachers are teachers preparing their students well and are you able to examine according to these syllabus objectives oh absolutely i mean you know the the objectives are there and i'd recommend if, if anyone wants to know what what an examiner is looking for it's just that they're they're the 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 things that we are only allowed to comment on it can't be anything else it has to be part of those objectives and so i do i have seen um, just on the most simple objective, the accuracy of notes and rhythms definitely has increased. The ability to keep in time has seemed to increase as well. And I think that, you know, again, when I was saying about not always being possible to be um, objectively listen when you're playing, um, we're not always sure um, when we're playing, uh, when we speed up and slow down, because time has a funny way of bending when we're in flow, um, as, as teachers will know. And but when we sit outside and say, oh, you know, and ask the student and say, oh, I was racing there. I didn't realize that or I, you know, X, Y and Z. So I think that um, that, yeah, there has been an ability for, for teachers to um, assess against themselves and their students against the syllabus criteria. Right. And I imagine it's it's um, traumatic for you if you have to give out a C or a C plus. How do you feel about those instances? Yeah, I mean, I th think more more traumatic is if is if the if it is a complete lack of success in the exam, um, and that could mean many things. It could mean that um, it could mean that the student doesn't have very good advice from their teacher, you know, or it could mean that there's some very unrealistic things happening, like maybe the student skipped multiple grades in a very short period of time because there's that um, competitive. Thing that goes on in social media amongst parents and teachers and about how young students can be passing certain grades not really knowing what the backstory is if there are some very young student children who do do high grades but maybe they there's, there's some interesting circumstances that goes around that so yeah i i never want um any student to do poorly um and you want to give out the highest mark possible um while still being objective because it wouldn't be fair um, for anybody that works hard, any teacher or any student that works hard, if there would have to be a new grading, wouldn't it? If everybody gets an A, then what do we do with the students who do better than those students? I mean, that's, you know, Absolutely. unfortunately. Absolutely. So it's all very well to have compassion and leniency as an, as an examiner, but then where are the where are the marks for what happens to the people who really really prepared well there have to be there has to be some um difference in in the marking um okay so how do you go about preparing your students for exams and has that process changed or become more nuanced at all since you became an examiner mm. so i can answer the second part of your question first and that is um as an examiner i have got to see that the standard is um, much wider than I thought it was, much higher at the high end and um, much you know, lower at the low end. It, it's, it was much, I, I was quite surprised by, by the, the, the sheer um, different levels and capabilities of students and, teach, and teaching out there. Um, so I guess sometimes I thought, well, actually that just, I've just heard the most wonderful performance of X piece and that's helped me to, with extra ideas for my own teaching. So in a way, um, like we are as teachers, as an examiner, I'm, I'm a learner as well. I'm learning all the time and I can hear the same piece played hundreds of times in a year. And I really have a good idea of all the different possibilities, expressive possibilities. How do I train my own students? If I'm, if I'm preparing them for an exam, that's a particular kind of thing. Um, so it, it becomes quite focused on a smaller number of pieces. Of course, there's the other other things that must go on, um, but this, this is a performance exam. So you have to prepare the students and make sure they've got the um, the technical skills and the um, the mental skills and the mental stamina um, that you develop the mental stamina for them um, so that maybe they can get through one short piece, but then they've got to be able to play two pieces and then three and then all their pieces for the exam. So that takes Quite a bit of preparation um, quite a bit of planning actually yes absolutely do um 
Well, thank you so much for all of that. Do you, you want it to, let's end on a positive note. What would be your best teaching tip uh, for preparing for, any, for a performance? Whether it's um, like if you had to summarize and you're just about to shoo a student out the door and don't forget, performance is all about something like that. Yeah, I can tell you exactly what it is. It's my mantra as well. It's um, and I use it to avoid um, performance anxiety. And I tell myself to sing, and I tell my students to sing, so that when you get nervous or you're not sure what to do when you're when you're playing the instrument, unless it's like Prokofiev or something very percussive. But the job of a piano, a pianist, is to make our instrument sing. So if I want to focus, I think of the singing line. I ask myself, can I make the line more beautiful? And how would a singer sing this line and sing, sing, sing? That's beautiful. I love that. We all have to sing more. Thank That's you, great. Anthony. This has been fantastic. You're so very welcome. And I wish you all the very best with um, pre preparation for video exams. Thank you. And yet another gem. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed all those insights from Anthony and in the full interview there are even more insights and uh, as I keep saying we will send you the link to that uh, in the follow-up email. So um, a lot of people saying that you know recordings have really helped in improving uh, students performance and um, it makes them listen to themselves um, but as Leela, Leela commented that um, she gets her students to do recordings anyway, we're just in a new era, a new era of preparation. Um, so now before we circle back to the seven deadly performance scenes, there's one uh, which would be, that'll be the last segment of today's webinar. There's one other area I'd like to briefly touch on and that is studio recitals. Now, even though here in Australia, we're only at the end of term one, so we're not really thinking about studio recitals yet. There are a lot of teachers um, watching this webinar who are in the US or the UK and they're just ramping up for recital season right now. Um, and I wanted to talk about that because in this pandemic age, um, there are three types of recitals that we're running now. There's the normal face-to-face, -face, everyone come into the room and um, students perform on a stage type recital. There's the completely online recital. Um, and then there's the hybrid recital where some performances are live and some performances are online. And in my opinion, the hybrid recital is the absolute most difficult to organize and bring together. Um, I would certainly love to hear your experiences with that. Um, now, last year, uh, my studio recital was in December. And at that time in Sydney, COVID cases were ramping right up and there was like a, a lockdown was imminent and we weren't sure exactly what was gonna happen. So I asked all my students, just in case we can't do a live performance, please do a backup video because just in case they get ill or had to isolate for some reason, I wanted to be able to show the video of their performance um, when it was their turn in the actual recital because uh, we're also in the age of now live streaming our face-to-face -face recitals. It's, it's just, who would have thought two years ago that we'd all been doing this? It's amazing. Okay, so I gave many instructions to my students on how to do these videos, but I either didn't get any back or I got such a wide variety of them back um, that it was, it, was, it was quite something to sort through. And I just wanted to show you two particular videos today because uh, one is an example of what to do and one is an example of what not to do. Now it's got nothing to do with the actual playing, it's just to do with the presentation. So first we have my student, um, now I think we were gonna show Evie first. Beth, yes, so we have my student, uh, Evie, who um, went to a lot of trouble, got all dressed up and um, announced her piece beautifully and then sat down and played. Uh, so we're gonna show that video first. And that is this, she followed my instructions to the letter. This is exactly what I asked for to, to be done. Hi, my name is Evie and I'm going to be performing Paul Una Cabeza by Gar Carlos Garda. Okay, so that was Evie. So, um, you know, beautifully, her mum was holding the camera, beautifully announced, clear, she dressed up and everything. Then this is another student of mine, India, gorgeous student, very busy teenager who just didn't read the instructions. And this is the video that she sent me.
Okay, so that was a bit of a problem, that video, because we couldn't see her face. She didn't announce what she was going to play. And um, that would have looked completely out of place with the live performances and the other performances, the video performances where students did announce them. So basically what I've learned from that experience is that parents and students don't read anything I write to them. They don't read the instructions. Um, and I'm sure you have found this as well. In fact, in my next newsletter to parents, I am going to put, I, I've always wanted to do this, I'm going to do it. If for the term two newsletter, I'm going to write two thirds of the way through the newsletter. If you have read this far, please ask for a $10 discount off your invoice. And I'm gonna see how much it costs me and I'm, I'm betting it won't cost me a cent. So anyway, they don't read instructions. Um, so I thought the best way to get this point across in the future is for me to show those two videos to all my students and ask them to pick what's right, what's wrong, what's going to look better in the concert, what's not. And um, so uh, visual examples, real life visual examples of what to do, what not to do, that is what works best. Okay. So on to our final segment of today's webinar, and that's to sum up with the seven deadly performance sins. Okay, so deadly performance sin number one is drawing attention to mistakes. Now it's fine to make a mistake. There's no problem, the mistakes happen all the time. It's not fine to say, sorry, oops, and say, oh, I think I'll just start again. Don't draw attention to the mistakes. Um, just acknowledge that they will happen and keep going. Performance sin number two is correcting mistakes. So often we hear students, well, as you saw in my video performance, I heard myself do a mistake, so I stopped and I tried to correct it. Now, once it is correct, the audience does not sit there and go, aha, that was the pitch I was waiting for. They don't, they just feel awkward because we've interrupted the flow of the performance. So we don't correct mistakes, we just let them go. If we make a pitch error, that's one thing, but if we stop to correct it, now we've made a rhythmic error and probably an expressive error too. So that's why we don't do that. Deadly performance in number three is starting too fast. This is because of the power of adrenaline. We are heightened for our performance. And so we have to get used to what that does to our bodies. And we have to understand how to control it. And we have to practice uh, simulating high pressure situations so that we know how to cope with that adrenaline and not start the piece too fast like I did with the Mozart earlier today. Deadly performance in number four, altering the conditions. This means that we have to have dress rehearsals. The reason I've got a picture of high heeled shoes there is because this happened to me. I was, uh, I selected a lovely pair of shoes for a recital I was giving. I had not practiced in them. They were too high. The pedaling was awkward for me and I ended up with a cramp in my calf. This was not fun. And I realized I hadn't practiced in the conditions that I was going to perform. Uh, and athletes have a fantastic saying about this. It's called nothing new on race day. So we wanna make sure that we've practiced exactly with the conditions we're gonna perform in. If we're going to perform without music, we have to practice without music. If we're going to perform with music, we have to practice with music. You can't change those conditions on the day. Deadly performance in number five, showing dissatisfaction. And I talked about this in the interview with Leela, that we have to be gracious. We have to have a poker face. And even if we think it's the worst performance ever, we cannot slump or tut or frown or show that we're unhappy with it. Most of the time, the audience won't have a clue that the performance is going badly, but they will if we communicate that to them via our body language. So we must always make it look as though we're completely happy. Deadly performance number six, deadly performance sin number six, breaking the spell. Now this is kind of like an X factor type of thing. It's very important that if something happens, if an audience member coughs, if the examiner happens to sigh or drop a pencil, that we don't look up and we don't get distracted because if we get distracted, the audience gets distracted and it breaks the spell of what we're trying to do in the performance. Now most of the time, an audience is just in, uh, even an examiner, a judge is in a listening reverie. They want to enjoy it and they want to watch our enjoyment of the piece. And that's what, that's what we must practice not breaking. And finally, deadly performance in number seven is ignoring the audience. We must smile and bow at the beginning. We must smile and bow at the end. If it wasn't for the audience, there would be no performance. 
So we can't perform and not acknowledge the audience. Also, I say to my students that if the audience is clapping for you and you don't bow, that's like not saying thank you. That would be rude. Bowing is our way of saying thank you for clapping for me. And it's just so important. But instead of talking about all these sins, how about if we flip them on their head and let's talk about the seven vital virtues of performance instead. So here they are. Number one, ignore mistakes. Number two, prioritize rhythm. Keep that flow no matter what. Number three, control the speed. Number four, have dress rehearsals. Number five, keep a poker face. Number six, cast a spell. And number seven, love the audience. So they are the seven vital virtues of performance. And uh, speaking of loving the audience, I have loved having you here with me uh, today. Thank you so much for giving up a huge chunk of your time uh, on this Friday morning. And if you're watching the replay, a huge chunk of your time whenever you happen to be watching it. Um, you will be getting the um, goodie bag in email with lots of really helpful links, blogs about performance, blogs on assessing performance, the full length interviews and um, some infographics from Leela and a discount code from Michelle. And uh, I have just really, really, really enjoyed presenting this for you. I hope you find it useful. I hope your students will find it useful. I think there are certainly many HSC students who could watch those interviews and just glean so much information. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and thanks so much for joining us and bye-bye.